There's a particular part of combat that I have found to not really come into my role-playing experience in modern run-and-gun play style genres that is a big part of the idiom of gunplay and combat in film. In films that really care about gun combat and want to show you a lot of detail in it. Take a look at the home invasion scene in John Wick for a little bit of what I'm talking about. Yes, this is a little on the violent side, so, you know, keep that in mind. But I think that it shows a great deal of what I think might be absent from your role-playing gameplay as well. Notice how John Wick is breaking up line of sight, how he's able to use the corners in his home in order to get into melee combat, where otherwise it's a gun engagement. Notice how he's engaging opponents through the walls. And notice how he's able to second guess his opponents. When they shoot high, he's able to shoot low through the wall. And part of this is the mastery of the environment because it's his own home. Part of it is because John Wick is Baba Yaga. But even in this other clip from Die Hard 4, there's a lot of the same sort of tempo uh, where there's engagement around and through obstacles. There's guesswork about where the enemy is or might not be in line of sight. And characters are able to disengage from the combat and get kind of multiple beats, quantized moments, as in turns, where they're not under fire because they're able to use line of sight. Now, the thing that I put to you is that what is holding us back from line of sight being a big part of how we interact with combat in our games? Now, one answer that I immediately came up with uh, as I thought about this is that maybe we do. Maybe it's a failure of description. It could be that the characters are always doing this just as part of a combat round. They're utilizing cover and in a mutual sense, if both opponents are using some of the cover to gain some amount of tactical advantage. This is, you know, that's the extra 10 points of your armor class outside of your dexterity and your physical armor. Maybe that's what's going on. It could be that, you know, the tactical space that they occupy, they're moving around in a great deal. And the moment that you roll to hit in combat is the moment where the opponent is exposed and they're they're not behind cover and all the other moments within the combat you're kind of waiting for your moment to strike and so the rolling of the dice encompasses all of the skirmishing that leads up to that uh, now this is great some games have an abstract combat system that can unfold at this sort of tempo and where this can work as a part of the mind's eye and you know, narrative dice system Genesis comes to mind as a place where actions of up to a minute in length can be one character's turn. But I wasn't satisfied there. I started to think that maybe it was user error or user ignorance in some fashion, that maybe players didn't have enough information about the environment in order to make informed choices and disengage from these combats. And when I had done it as a game master, maybe I was using kind of superior clarity of information. The enemies were skirmishing and going around corners and such. And I knew with confidence that those corners were real obstacles. I knew the thickness of the walls and the players didn't. So when they answered with their own kind of ideas, they were stumbling and the combat would drag out a long time. It would feel frustrating because the players, you know, didn't have the same tools. And, and I gave that a little bit of thought because after all, I do think that we do want our combats to look and feel a little bit like the genres that we see played out on the screen. That's a lot of the mechanics are present. I mean, after all, Grenades and rifle grenades are a significant component of you know, the equipment lists in games like Traveler and Starfinder and so on. And yet those moments that you 
might be able to take an entire kind of segment of your turn to pull out this grenade and try and ricochet it around a corner or toss it over an obstacle, you know, you, are you really going to give up your turn and, you know, the sure shot of engaging with your firearm in order to do something that might not work at all and costs you actions, plural? Well, this is, you know, this is something which I thought maybe I needed to do something about. I started to think about what it is that could be done. One answer that I had was that maybe theater of the mind falls short here. Maybe this is something that tactical maps can do in a way that theater of the mind can't. They can clearly explain what the landscape of combat is like and that, you know, there's this huge renaissance of really great tactical maps to choose from that have a lot of clarity about where line of sight is and even what the 3D relief of the terrain has uh, even projected onto two dimensions. People have gotten really good at drawing this stuff. I'll put some versions of it up here on the screen for you. And I thought, maybe this is what, what it has been absent, is that if characters had more clarity about what their character was doing, where they were on the map, and how thick the tree was that they wanted to get behind, and whether that tree would stop bullets, whether there was really, you know, a long alleyway that they could get away, and there's lots of curtains and cloths hanging from clotheslines down this alleyway to break up line of sight, maybe they would do it. That might be true. But then the other side of the coin is that most of these maps are incredibly small. They are, you know, often 20 by 30, 30 by 40 on the five foot square grid. The scale involved is such that even if you did disengage and get out of line of sight, whether you had even one turn of action where you might be able to reset the combat and get into a different rhythm, there's uh, really variable. In other words, these maps are overwhelmingly crafted for use as D&D &D encounters, and specifically the kind of D&D &D encounters that are going to be knock down, drag out, full frontal fights. The other issue about these otherwise good maps is that they're pretty specific, but in a way that's coming in from the outside of the game. I think there's a fair number of players that look at inclusions from outside of the Game Master's personal imagination as cosmetic. In other words, even though there may be an overturned cart in the marketplace, even though there may be a fruit stand full of melons, some people may look at that as not something that can be interacted with unless it rises to the dignity of a narration. And for that matter, I think that a lot of game masters also look at utilities like these maps in that same light as as in it's cosmetic but i don't necessarily accept it whole cloth into my world now normally what i do is that i accept these maps in a whole cloth way as game master because i see this is an opportunity to tie my own hands and to remove any sort of moral hazard but I'm not sure that that's the same case for everyone. So let's kind of strike two for maps as a be-all, end-all solution for this conundrum. And strike three for maps is that while there's a lot of clarity in the details for many of these maps that are really expertly made, that clarity might not be mutual. As in, what I see on the map may not be the same thing that you see on the map. And we may have a lot of conversation that might be necessary to gain mutual clarity. Well, it's pretty hard to hatch like a clever plan and then spring it on the game master and thus the NPC that he's role-playing if you have to have a protracted negotiation and consensus building moment about what exactly that ledge or shelf within the tavern is. So don't take for a second my saying that there are three strikes against maps to mean that maps have struck out in any way when it comes to tactical gunplay or to be used at the table in general. It's just that I don't think maps are the silver bullet here that can solve this entire problem. So with that in mind, I started to look further afield 
And one place that friends told me to look was the role of skills, and specifically the way that skills can bring out a return on investment. When a character gives up their turn within the action economy, a skill can get them back an action's worth of benefits, of yield, of effectiveness relative to just taking the default answer of engaging a target with a weapon in line of sight in the normal way. Here are some examples of that. The first, of course, is one that we're already really familiar with, which is stealth. A character can use stealth to find the places where the enemy can't see them, to hide in shadows. And we regularly take for granted that this can reset the combat initiative, at least at the beginning. This can give a full extra surprise round in a lot of games to a character. So let's open up our minds a little bit more to how other skills could do similar things. One is if there's something like a tactic skill, if there's any sort of way of expressing a character's experience and acumen and cleverness at setting up the encounter. One of the things that we can do here is allow characters to dictate how they begin the combat. Who is on the map where when the combat begins? Because there's a part of the Baba Yaga scene that I didn't show you, which is John Wick waiting in his home, preparing himself carefully for the encounter. We see the thugs creeping up to his homestead from outside in the night. And that's really all part of the lead up to the encounter. It's not as if the character and the player are suddenly sprung upon within their home. Nay, John Wick sees it coming. Another place where actions can yield a return on investment is in terms of empathy. If you can see the battlefield through your opponent's eyes, through their fear, through their eagerness to get the job done, through their bloodthirst, then you can see the actions that they would take and be one step ahead of them, effectively gaining an extra action because where they go, you won't be or they'll waste their turn shooting at a shadow, which is in fact not you, just your coat tree in your home. Those sorts of moments are deception. They are persuasion. They are a whole host of skills that have to do with looking at the other person's perspective. And we don't have to know precisely what that person's perspective is when we're trying to deceive someone out of combat. We just try and tell a good story. We try and leave a convincing argument. And sometimes we leave it up to the dice, what follows afterwards, and whether the person is convinced. Maybe we should be opening the door to that sort of thing as a part of gameplay and combat as well. It's perfectly within your purview as the game master to describe a shadow as an enemy creeping up when in fact the enemy is a hatchery. Or you could describe something like a Roomba whirring around the corner and that might be some sort of combat drone which uh, turns out to be a vacuum cleaner. The shadows that go bump in the night are a place where actions can be gained by characters. And with that advantage, we can start to see some variety within these gunplay style encounters. The next skill to consider is something like athletics, because once these characters have broken line of sight and they're on the run trying to look for a place where they can gain some tactical advantage, they're often really working their constitution and sprinting, making a break for it. And in that moment, in order to really get ahead of the opponent, how do we stretch out that lead time? What is that contest really? Of course, there could be a number of intervening rounds in gameplay, which, you know, if we take it very literally, there wouldn't be a contest, an opposed set of athletics checks. But maybe this is another place where we could allow a contest of that nature, a opposed skill check, to give something like a surprise round. Because after all, once the combat breaks into a chase, one of the things that we often see is that the quarry is looking for some place where they can either get a little bit more time or they can set up an ambuscade on the pursuer. So we take for granted the idea that stealth and ambush can be a place where characters can get an advantage within the action economy of games. 
But what about really great vigilance? Are there any skills that might really acknowledge that possibility that characters are so well on guard, they're really set up to receive an attack and they might be able to get an advantage within the action economy in the same way? Well, Traveler has something called Recon, and we've been using it a lot in our game to acknowledge that vigilance that the ex-Marine Colonel has when these Travelers are going into unknown waters. And he's been able to see the places where the Travelers might be in peril, and encounters have been avoided altogether, or the Travelers have been able to set up their own ambushes, knowing how the lay of the land can best advantage them. This case of the missing moments of grenades rattling around corners, of Baba Yaga leaping from the darkness onto unwitting foes, is by no means solved. But I do think that I'm on the case now. I think that as I open the door within my mind to returns on investments that really reach the same scale as what I've always given stealth, that possibility that a character can find a reed to hide behind and that they can spring from that ambush and really stab someone in the back, if I extend that same feeling, that same ability for the skill to bring about little wrinkles within the world onto things like tactical awareness, onto empathy for the enemy's point of view, and that seeing down the road what the enemy will do can lead a character to stabbing the enemy in the back, then I will be in a good place. I need to tune up my ability to narrate the player character's point of view when the enemies are getting the better of them. And that's something that I'll be exploring in a future video, is how to narrate and how to transmit information that enemies have controlled in some way. That as the enemies have succeeded with these abilities to project empathy on the player characters, as they've got their number, what do I tell the player? What do I tell the room about what they're seeing and what they're experiencing? That's the sort of topic that I like to explore here on the channel with you. So if you like that sort of video, then why don't you hit the like button? Why don't you subscribe and share this video around? Because I do like to grow this channel so that I can spend more time doing it and share these interesting moments of exploring our hobby together.